With just over a week until the NBA draft, the debate is on. Do the Sacramento Kings select a player that helps them win games right now? Or do they take a swing on a prospect that needs time to develop? Maybe goes to the G League to help answer that question. Plus talk about all the great options that the Sacramento Kings have at the 24 spot in this upcoming NBA draft. Kyle Boone, and draft analyst from CBS Sports, joins me right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off season long. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News. And I always look forward to speaking with this gentleman. Kyle Boone is uh, just an incredible uh, draft analyst, an awesome guy, uh, someone who... Uh, I've become friends with and become very familiar with the work that he does uh, over the time that I've been hosting the, uh, the Locked on Kings podcast. He joins me basically every single summer uh, to talk about the the, the Kings draft, and he's um, not just really, really good at breaking down this entire draft class. He pays specific attention to each team and where different teams are at in making his mock drafts and trying to identify prospects for that team. Uh, and he has a pretty solid understanding of what the Sacramento Kings are looking for. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation, us talking about uh, drafting for like fit and to help the team immediate impact type player right now versus uh, looking for maybe a longer term prospect who has a higher ceiling and could turn into a really solid player for the Sacramento Kings, maybe two or three years uh, down the road. Kyle and I are going to discuss that. I think you're going to be really uh, pleased to hear the different names that Kyle brings up for different reasons, whether it's for defensive reasons, offensive reasons. Uh, we talk about um, like uh, big men prospects versus like wings and guards and, and just a, a wide variety. You're going to know a lot more about this draft class and the options for the Sacramento Kings uh, at that range, even some uh, second round talent to keep an eye on as well. So please enjoy this conversation with CBS draft analyst, Kyle Boone. Here we are, single digit days away from the start of the NBA draft. It's almost here, and it is the perfect time to have my good friend Kyle Boone over from CBS Sports on. Kyle is one of the CBS Sports draft analysts. He's been on basically every single year <laughs> of the uh, that I've been hosting Locked on Kings around this time, around draft time. I was like, Call up Kyle, get him on because he's one of the best draft analysts and draft uh, guys out there. Kyle, it's great to have you back on Locked on Kings, my friend. Bit different circumstance for the Kings, right? They're in a position where they the draft doesn't matter as much to them as it has in the past, but still it's important, of course. Yeah, the Kings are good. The Kings have gotten good since last time we talked. It's fantastic. It's a it's a welcome development, um, especially from last year where everyone, you know, I think was kind of clowning uh, the Kings in general just because – the Kings stay Kings, but also because they took Keegan Murray, uh, maybe higher than some people expected. Uh, they had some, you know, Sabonis was fantastic. Fox made a leap. And so this team is actually really good, which means they're picking in, you know, the mid twenties. Now it, it's an interesting situation. I think there's some interesting pieces that they could acquire in that spot. So I'm sure we'll get to that, but yeah, it's uh, a lot has happened since we last talked in terms of kind of the trajectory of this franchise, mostly for the better. So I'm happy to uh, to be in a little bit more positive move to uh, to hopefully talk some uh, some good Kings propaganda here on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, typically the range the Kings are in the lottery, like you you kind of understand what the strategies are. Take best talent available versus uh, the best fit for your roster. But ultimately, especially for a team in the Kings position, you're looking for like a, a game changer or a potential franchise changer. Here in this 24, four range like I don't know what necessarily the strategy or the approach is so I was going to ask you like in your mind around this range maybe for in general or for this specific class for a team like the Sacramento Kings 
do you look for a player that you think can help you immediately accomplish your goals? Maybe a more NBA ready player who might have a lower ceiling or do you, is this where you take the swing on like a developmental project that you can be patient with, even if they're not going to help you right away, you put them in a good system, stash them in the G league for a year or two, and then try and get them into something maybe two, three years down the road. Yeah, I, th- I think this is like probably the most relevant. This is a great question. I think it's the most relevant question for anyone who is picking in the 20s and seriously considers themselves as contenders. Do you do you do like the Denver Nuggets approach where last year they end up picking uh, Christian Brown in the 20s? He ends up being like a really valuable role player for an NBA title winner on, by the way, like a really cheap contract. And I think there's a ton of value in in getting players like that. The problem is you're taking a fairly significant swing in hopes that like the short-term payoff um, is is significant. And like, it is short-term. It's not going to be a, necessarily a long-term player. Like Christian Brown is not someone who is going to be a, an all-star in five years if you have the de- the right development program for him. Um, he's someone who I think fits in with this team, um, but is, uh, he is what he is, right? So you could go that direction if you're the Kings and you're picking at 24, get someone who I think, you know, could be a really valuable role player and kind of help buttress this team's depth guys like, you know, Colby Jones from, from Xavier would make a lot of sense. I've been talking about Chris Murray. Cause I think Murray twin reunion would be fantastic. And I actually think the fit would be good there. Um, or you could go kind of take a swing. Um, you could you could go for someone who, you know, depending on how this draft falls, Gigi Jackson from South Carolina mm. is is potentially going to be in the mix there at 24. I don't think he's a guy who will play much next season if he's on the Kings. But in three years, like, you get some mixed opinions, right, on a number of players, but including Gigi Jackson, like, his – ceiling is very very high he was the number one prospect coming out of his class uh just just a year ago before reclassifying so you know he he didn't have a great year but you know in a few years if you put him in the right program get him on the right track in the right culture the right system you know maybe this is a guy who isn't just a role player who who fills kind of a need for you as you're trying to contend for an nba championship he's a guy who you know three four years down the line could end up being like a really valuable building block piece so it's, uh, I don't know exactly, and you can kind of guide me whichever way you want. I don't know exactly which direction the Kings would lean here, but at 24, if your team is really good, you have kind of the pieces, I think, to, to be like a legitimate factor in that conference. Um, I would tend to, to kind of lean, and, and this is just me just in general draft philosophy-wise, I would tend to lean like just take as big a swing as you can. Whoever is the biggest name there, who you think can be the biggest star, whether that's next year or five years from now or whatever, don't, don't think short term because yes, there's, there's like obviously a payoff with, with, you know, short term returns. Um, but you don't want to sacrifice kind of the future either. So there's definitely a balancing act and I'm curious to see kind of how the Kings um, address that, especially, you know, picking at 24 in this draft. Well, I'll be honest with you. One of the, th- few thing or one of the only ways that I'm I'm or areas in this draft that I'm confident in in, in terms of putting my head in uh, or, or trying to guess what Monty McNair and the Sacramento Kings front office is going to do is yep. I, I'm confident they're going to make a selection at 24 and the reason mm-hmm. for that is is kind of what you were touching on with the Denver Nuggets getting a potentially solid player on a really really good contract and i think the kings right. are really going to be looking at the the financial aspect of a 24th overall pick because they're looking at paying Sabonis, Monk, Ke- uh, Keegan Murray one day uh, so they'll be keeping that in mind. So the only thing i feel really confident in is that the kings are going to make a selection at 24 and not trade the pick. However, like i came into this draft going you got to find a player that can help you right now. And someone, uh, I was chatting with a couple people that were saying, hey, maybe the Sacramento Kings are finally in a position where they have enough of an established culture to actually take a swing on a high upside player who needs that development time. Because in the past, the Kings have been horrible at developing that kind of talent. Now they have Mike Brown. They have an established culture, really good development staff, really good veterans to help lead them along. So it'll be interesting to see what route the Sacramento Kings go. But Kyle, one thing that excites me about this, this draft class and particularly in that, in that 24 range is there's a lot of threes and a lot of fours in that range. And that's 
those are always positions that the Sacramento Kings, especially the three, need more depth in. Uh, so it looks mm-hmm. like if they are going to draft for fit, there are a lot of options there. No, I think I think that's absolutely right. It's it's interesting this class because <clears throat> the big men, the quality of big men and and the depth of big men is just basically non-existent, but there's a lot of really good wings. There's some pretty good like combo guard, you know, two, two and a half, three guards. Um, so there's a there's a lot of different ways that I think the Kings could go in this range. Um if, if you're looking at wings, I, I think there's some really interesting kind of high upside swings that could be available in this range. Uh, Leonard Miller from G League Ignite, I think is really interesting. He's like six foot nine, very toolsy, really, really productive with, with G League Ignite. I think has like real, real potential to be a significant contributor. He's, he's really good as, as kind of a passer, a playmaker. Kind of fits, um, you know, similar kind of archetype to I think Sabonis' skill set without being like overly duplicative, uh, which I, which I think is important. Um, you look you look at like for example the Oklahoma City Thunder, like you you really can't have too many players who are selfless and know how to pass. Mm-hmm. Like regardless of whether you know they play one, two, three, four, or five, like Jokic is a five, obviously. That the Nuggets team is like very good at sharing the basketball. OKC is really good at sharing the basketball. They have Giddy, Shigil, just Alexander. I mean, there's so many like selfless pieces. So that would be an interesting one. Um, there's uh, you know like Ryan Rupert from from France overseas. He's like six foot six, six foot seven. Reminds me a little bit of like Brandon Boston for the Clippers, who who I think could end up being like an interesting developmental piece. Um, Derek Whitehead from from Duke had two surgeries this this past year, foot surgeries. So I think there there's a lot of like generally the consensus is down on Derek Whitehead, but you know he's he's six foot seven, one of the most explosive athletes when healthy in this class was a five star recruit, like top five in his class. Um, I think the injury concerns you're you're probably if you're drafting Derek Whitehead, you're you're betting that you know maybe he's not back to his explosive form next season, but Two years, three years down the line, could end, could end up paying off as like a top fifteen player in this class. Like that is kind of, if I'm the Kings and I've, I'm Monty McNair, that is kind of the direction that I think I would personally um, be approaching this draft. Is like, hey, we we have a really good team right now, but we also are aware that like the top of the NBA is so loaded. We don't we're not one piece away from like securing an NBA title. So let's let's try and get someone who maybe doesn't fit immediately and, and make a, a significant impact right away. Let's let's bet on someone who I think has like high long-term ceiling and and maybe will give us a payoff in, in one or two years where down the line it's like, okay, that ended up being like one of the best 15 players in this class, even though we got him at 24. Uh, it, it turns out like being a, a really a really good value. So there's lots of options. I mean, I could go through the whole list here between like twos, threes, and fours, but uh, the Kings will have like no shortage, I think, of like really, really quality options in this range. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part fits just right the first time around. You add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit. Or you get your money back because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop at eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. I have your mock draft open in front of me or your latest uh, big board open in front of me. You have at 24 yep. Trace Jackson Davis out of Indiana, um, yep. which I've, I've heard good things. I've heard bad things, especially when it comes to kind of a lack of shooting. He's someone that we've talked about on the podcast before. Um, I've also learned a lot about being in this range means that 
you're going to see guys that are at 24 one day that are 14 the next type thing and 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 vice versa <laughs> like there's just a, a high variety um so that doesn't necessarily mean that like trace jackson davis is the guy at at this spot but i'm curious what you see in in jackson davis and why you think sacramento if he was on the board at 24 why you think sacramento would make that selection yeah, to me, to me, like just like full transparency, the the mock draft exercise is mostly mostly like a I project this player in this range. Mm-hmm. Um, when we get closer to the draft, like I know we're single digit days away from the draft now, but the, still, there's not like, uh, well, you know, the Lakers at 17, they're really eyeing Jed Howard or something. Mm-hmm. So like, some of that stuff is going to come out in the days before the draft, and those that's when I think like the mock drafts really get drilled in, but. To me, uh, Trace Jackson Davis, like in this range, makes a lot of sense, and also like stylistically and with his skill set, makes a lot of sense. He's he's left-handed, um, so it reminds me of Sabonis. He's like very skilled as a passer. Reminds me of Sabonis, and again, like I'm not trying to add a second Sabonis to the roster, but just in general, like the selflessness with which he plays, the style with which he plays, like he's a very dominant power forward center type prospect, and he's really good at what he does. And frankly, like he's not very good at what he doesn't do. And that's fine. He knows kind of what he is as a player. He has never been a three-point shooter. In fact, I think if you look at his stats, he's taken like maybe one three-pointer in four seasons at Indiana. He's not a floor spacer. Um, When I saw him at the combine, he was shooting a lot of threes, which I thought was really interesting. A scout that I talked to was like, hey, like we have like real belief that he could end up being like a floor spacing big man who can play multiple positions and maybe play like small ball five at the next level. So I think there's some untapped potential there as well. And in general, like you, you look at four year players and you think like, ah, he's old. Like there's not a lot of potential. He was one of the best players in college basketball last season for like a not insignificant amount of time and was an all American. Like he's, he's very productive at the highest level of college basketball. You know, he's, I don't think he has star potential, but again, it goes back to kind of philosophy, right? Like if you think you can get a really quality rotation player at 24 and Jackson Davis is there I think it would be a fantastic pick and um so yeah I, I, that's that's why I have him kind of in this range would make a lot of sense kind of give that give, give this team some depth and um some, some passing some playmaking like I think he checks a lot of boxes kind of for what he's going to be in the NBA well speaking of ranges you have something in, in 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 this that excites me a little bit because I've I've heard for the most part that he's probably not in that twenty four range for the Sacramento Kings, and maybe this means you're lower on him than than other people are. But uh, Derek Lively out of Duke. Mm-hmm. Now I know the Kings have a history with uh, Duke big men not going exactly the the best, but in terms of why, what happened? <laughs> nothing, no, nothing, <laughs> no, just a little mistake here and there. Um, the you talked about earlier, like the lack of bigs, the lack of centers. One of the things the Sacramento Kings really lack is rim protection, like shot block. They just don't have it. So right. while I'm not expecting a, uh, a freshman um, prospect to come in and suddenly make the Sacramento Kings a good rim protecting team, it's easy to look at Derek Lively and kind of fall in love with the idea of how you could change shots around the rim and how you could plug him in for 10, 15 minutes a game and just have him do that for you right away while he develops in other ways. But I've seen him, like, if he makes it to the 20s in a lot of people's mind, like, they're surprised by that. You have him at 22 going to the the, the Brooklyn Nets or in that 20s range. So why do you have Derek Lively there? Yeah, I mean, hand up. I'm, I'm probably wrong there. Uh, that probably needs to be adjusted. I, I, I think he's probably been... I wouldn't say the biggest riser, but he has definitely risen in the minds of kind of like talent evaluators. And I think in front of, of like NBA front offices too, where, you know, last season, his, his counting stats, like for a player who I think was ranked at one time, the number one player in his class, he's seven foot, like a just totally devastating defensive force, especially like defending the rim and, and protecting the rim his counting stats aren't really all that impressive. Like you look at kind of his numbers and and what he did for, for Duke last season, you're like, okay, like, am I going to take this guy 10th in the draft? Like, it just seems like crazy. He doesn't really space the floor. Um, He averaged like 5.2 points, 5.4 rebounds, uh, 2.4 blocks per game. Like it's solid, but it doesn't, it doesn't exactly scream. Like I'm going to take this guy with the lottery pick. So um, but he's definitely had a, like a really good pre-draft process. I think similar to Jackson Davis, and this is probably you have to 
try and read the smoke screens? Like how much of this is like, oh, he's shooting threes now. Like how much of that actually translates versus how much do we actually hear about it? Like we hear about it every single year, but does it actually work? Yeah, we'll see. Uh, but I think there is some optimism with Lively that he can be like a, a competent 35-ish percent three-point shooter. He basically didn't do that at Duke. Um, so yeah, like I, I think if he gets to 24, like that would be amazing. I don't think it's likely that he gets there. Um, somewhere in the like 12 to 20 range, I think is probably more realistic, more realistic for him, but definitely I think would check a lot of boxes for, for what the Kings are looking for, you know, like the shot blocking. I don't feel like you can have enough length, um, athleticism, like front court. He can be like a true, like anchor for, for your team on defense. And that, man, that's hard to find. It's hard to find, especially if you can get that at 24 in a draft, like, That'd be excellent value. Um, I will say, like, on top of that, I think there's, like, it wouldn't be my favorite pick. Um, But if you're you're 24, Sacramento, like, I think probably what I would prefer, assuming that Lively does not slip to 24, which I don't think is realistic, Mm -hmm. what I would do if I'm the Kings, and this is just, like, me trying to game out something that I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but at 24, I would go, like, a, a guard or a wing, uh, try and take like a high upside swing. And then I, I think back at 54, like you could get a realistic, like reasonable gamble um, for like a front court player. Uh, there's, there's a lot of like quality options that I think will be available in this range. Um, James Naji, he's a seven footer from Nigeria would make a lot of sense as, as a potential like developmental player who has shown some potential. He's like 250 pounds. He's, he's super athletic. Uh, Tristan Vucevic, who's from Serbia, he's you know six foot eleven, seven foot, was really impressive when I saw him at the combine. Like the scoring, the shooting, the the ability to f- space the floor, I think is really interesting. He ended up staying in the draft on the uh, international withdrawal deadline yesterday. So, um, yeah, I, I think if you wanted to, I, I'm in in general, I am in favor of like trying to wait to address your front court. Uh, later in the draft or even like going undrafted because I just think in general, unless you're getting like a Jokic or an Embiid or someone who's like totally dominant at, 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 at the game um, you can find value elsewhere in the draft. And I think probably if you're the Kings um, in, in like the twenties, there's going to be so many like really good pieces uh, guards, wings, threes, fours, who, uh, who I think would make a lot of sense. You brought up Chris Murray earlier. I too am a, a, a believer in the idea of reuniting the twins here in Sacramento, and and Keegan has shared that he wouldn't mind that himself. Uh, something about this that excites me, even though he's uh, not necessarily in the Kings' range on on your uh, board and, and, and in your mock draft. You have him at fourteen, going to uh, to the New Orleans Pelicans, and I actually like that because I, I think Chris Murray like. Keegan Murray was labeled a safe pick last year. And that, that always bothered me because safe just meant he was good at a lot of things and really solid, but wasn't maybe as flashy. And that's not was necessarily what the right. Sacramento Kings need. And here comes Keegan coming into the league. I don't expect Chris to be Keegan. If so, Chris would be in the top five range, right? I'm not expecting that. Yes. But if you have that skill set, especially from a Kings perspective, you can always use more of that skill set. And Chris Murray is someone who, as an older prospect, I feel could come in and contribute right away uh, with the uh, with the second unit in, in some capacity. Um, you can always use more of those type of players. So what is it about Chris Murray that that makes you think, man, he could be in that in that just outside the lottery end of the lottery, that teens range? Yeah, I mean, like this is this is basically I will just like hand up. This is basically like, this is what I'm hearing about like his range. Like I think he could go somewhere between like, um, you know, like late lottery or early to mid twenties. So like somewhere between like 14 to 25, I think is like a realistic range for him. Mm -hmm. Um, I have him ranked on the higher end because from what I saw last season at Iowa, like he was fantastic. You know, less in 2021, 22, he was averaging, you know, single digit points, single digit rebounds per game. He was not just another guy, but he wasn't really like the guy. Um, and and uh, so last season at Iowa, he, he makes a huge leap, is uh, all Big Ten, averaging 20, 20.2 points per game, eight rebounds per game, shot uh, 33.5%. 
from three and really just checked a lot of boxes, I think, for what a really good NBA role player can be. He's a good spot up shooter. He's a really good, like, natural scorer, like, shoot, like scoring in isolation situations. Um, his, his post up scoring, according to Synergy data, which I pulled up here, 91st percentile this past season. His transition scoring is, uh, is very good, according to like points per possession metrics. Um, his offensive rebounding is very solid. He, he's not quite the shooter that, that Keegan is or was. He's not quite the athlete. I don't think that Keegan is or was, but I think he's really good kind of as a, a, a combo forward who can do a bunch of different things. He's a, he's a really good kind of natural passer, creator, that needs to probably cut down on, on some turnovers and stuff, but I don't think it's going to be his role necessarily in the NBA. So, um, yeah, like I, I, I think it'd be totally reasonable to, to see him go in that, in that late lottery range. And, um, like, I, I, I think the fit with, with the Kings specifically, like if he slips that far, uh, it would be fantastic. Like just, mm-hmm. let's just reunite the twins there. I, I think they can play off of each other really well. And, um, and it wouldn't just be like a bit like they wouldn't just be adding a twin just to add a twin. Like, I think he's a really useful NBA player um, who has like real lottery potential in this class. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. Make your way to FanDuel right now because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to two thousand five hundred dollars that's two thousand five hundred dollars back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win i know the nba is over but you can bet on things like the draft you can bet on the mlb season right now football is going to be here before we know it play on fanduel decide to give it a try and know that there's a essentially insurance policy in place because fanduel wants you to continue playing they don't just want you to go make one bet with all the money that you feel comfortable uh, putting on the line, losing that bet and then leaving and never coming back. They want you to stay. They want you to have fun, enjoy the thrills and and fun that um, is sports betting while also enjoying the sports and games that you love. But also knowing that if that first bet doesn't go quite your way, you can get up to $2,500 back in bonus bets for you to make that money back or make even more money on top of that. Eventually there's no better place to bet on all of your sports action than America's number one sports book. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. Kings fans are going to get mad at me if I don't ask you about Imani Bates. Uh, he recently had a <laughs> workout here in Sacramento and there are, he has a, a group of people here in Sacramento that are like, if the Kings could get him in the second round, that would be amazing. Like they're just very high on Imani Bates. What are you, what is your opinion on that man? I mean, I wouldn't do it. Um, yeah. I would say, I would say, I would say don't do that personally. Um, just the tra- trajectory of Imani Bates is a little concerning. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you, I'll paint the quick like trajectory for Imani Bates, which is, Former number one recruit in his class was long viewed like as the Victor women Yama of, of basketball. Like people thought he was the next guy, like Kevin Durant comparisons looked like a stud. He had the size, the link, the scoring ability, like can create his own shot, insane talent. Um, and just kind of fades a little bit throughout uh, the back half of his high school career ends up reclassifying, goes to Memphis as a five-star recruit, loses that number one recruiting ranking in his class um, is fairly productive at Memphis, but clearly the numbers bore out that Memphis when he was not on the court was a better team than when Memphis was playing and he was on the court. So uh, he transfers to Eastern Michigan. He's from uh, that area. He puts up a really solid season, maybe not the most efficient, but has like great counting stats. And now he's in a spot where he's definitely, he has a huge name. Everyone knows Imani Bates. Um, but he, he doesn't carry the same like scouting cachet as, mm-hmm. as maybe he did a few years ago. So, I mean, look, if you're like, if you have a pick in the fifties, I don't have any problem with just being like, all right, sure. Let's just see what happens. Like maybe he can become a useful player. Me personally, I think I would probably go a different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like I, th- I think there's real concerns about Imani Bates and what he can be at the next level because his, his shot, taking is impressive but his decision making and how he takes those shots is concerning i'm not entirely sure like chemistry wise how that would work 
I'm not entirely sure how cultural wise it would fit. Um, I think there's a lot of like real questions and I, and I will say I was impressed with like what I saw from him at the combine, a lot of like clapping. It almost felt fake. I don't know if it was fake, but it was, it was very much like I'm encouraging my teammates. I want to be a good teammate to be around. Like he was very invested, very involved and I've never been around him, but I was impressed kind of with how he carried himself. He wasn't, you know, the most effective player. I don't think he was any standout by any means, but trying to fit within a system, I think will be really challenging for him. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I stand. Like if you want to take a pick on him in, in the fifties or even get him as an undrafted player, kind of develop him tools wise, like the, it's off the charts. It's just um, like, I would, I would probably just personally prefer to go a different direction. Another weakness of the Sacramento Kings was defense with how good their offense was. Their defense got better in the playoffs. A lot of that had to do with the referee whistle probably backing off a little bit more than in the regular season. But defense is definitely something they're going to look to address. It's something that obviously Mike Brown is very passionate about as a head coach. In the Kings yeah. range, in that 20s range, do you see potential like really, really solid defensive prospects that maybe have some ways to go offensively to, to get to the level that they need to be at but defensively you see the willingness to put in the dirty work and the raw ability to come in and help a team like sacramento not necessarily change them to a good defensive team overnight but just defensively yeah. give them a little bit of more of a, of a presence yeah I'll, i so i'll let i'll name two guys here um who i think would fit like almost exactly what you're what you're talking about the first is olivier maxence prosper from marquette they call him omax prosper was uh was definitely one of the standouts at the NBA draft combine like participated in the first day of scrimmages played so well and made such an impact that he's just like yeah you know i think i'm good the rest of the week i'm gonna chill and uh played his way i think clearly into the first round range and now i think is 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 gonna potentially be in the mix for the kings in like in that range if he hasn't already been selected um affects the game just like with his energy with his attitude He's like a, a very like fun player to be around, kind of a glue guy, does a lot of dirty work, loves to give great energy on both ends of the floor. He's a guy who like does not care at all about what stats he's putting up. It's more like, am I winning or am I not? Mm -hmm. And that type of player I think is super, super valuable in the NBA. Like guys who don't have an ego, who just want to freaking win basketball games, I think is, is really, really exciting. So Omax Prosper to me, I think is, is someone who I think will be available kind of in that range. Makes a lot of sense. There's, I think some questions about what he's going to be on, on offense and, and what he can be as an offensive piece in general, but <clears throat> the defense, the intangibles, the leadership, like he's, he's someone who I think you kind of just want in your foxhole and want on your team. Another one I'll mention here, different position. He's, he's more of a on ball off the ball combo guard andre jackson jr from yukon he's you know, six foot six 200 pounds can play both guard positions again another one who's similar to uh derek lively earlier who we talked about just like you look at his raw counting stats last season yukon won the national championship for those who who don't know he averaged a whopping 6.7 points 6.2 rebounds 4.7 assists per game he was not even anywhere close really to being like the most outstanding player of the final four. A lot of people probably look at, you know, Jordan Hawkins, who was a great shooter, Adama Sanogo as like the dominant inside presence for that team and think like, okay, well, he was the third, fourth best player on a title team. Like how impressive that is that for someone who's already in his twenties, but he is, he has drawn, I think a lot of hype and a lot of interest from teams picking in the twenties. He's, he's got great size, um, a guy who I think similar to Omax Prosper is, um, is a, is a quality teammate. Like UConn went on a stretch to start the 2023 calendar year where they lost six of eight games by all accounts. Jackson was the guy who kind of like steadied that ship and helped them get back on track and, and end up winning the national title, a very vocal leader, a guy who like holds people accountable. He loves to play defense. He loves to do the dirty work. He's a very, unselfish player he likes to get others involved he's he's a great passer and playmaker um the offense is absolutely i think probably one of the biggest concerns with him last season shot you know 36 from three this pat this 2022 23 season 
he fell back down to, to 28.1, um, kind of in a, in, a, in a similar role. So I think there's some, some concerns there about how his shot will project to the NBA level. But yeah, like two guys who I think have, have some real questions about what they will be on offense, but bring a lot of intangibles, bring a lot of defense, bring a lot of like glue guy skills that like if I'm just in a draft room and I'm standing up for some players, like the character stuff, the, the great teammate stuff, like those are the type of players that, uh, that I'm willing to kind of stand on a soapbox and be like, yeah, I, I think I'm willing to take a chance. Just hoping like if they can develop a consistent shot, be a really consistent offensive player, they're going to bring a lot of value. And I think be like really quality role players in the NBA for a long time. Got two more for you. I ask you this every single year. Is there a is there a player or a couple players that you think are going to be like diamond in the rough type players or players that you're really high on that you think when we do redrafts and look back on this draft class three, four years from now, they're they're way higher or they're at the top of the draft and and, and one of the steals of the draft. And then in the same kind of facet, are there any red flag guys for you from this uh, from this class? Oh yeah. Yeah. The red, the red flag question I'm familiar with. Uh, This is one of my favorite uh, interview questions you always give me every year. Uh, The first one I think that I'll, I'll note off the top here is someone who I think is maybe a little bit undervalued, uh, but will end up being like a quality piece in the NBA. Uh, Pepperdine combo forward, Maxwell Lewis. He's Mm. uh, he was one of the best players this, this past season in, in the WCC really productive. Um, he, he was uh, a sophomore this past season. Um, he's, he's got great size. I think, uh, you know, it's at, you know, around six foot seven, I think his, his scoring ability, his ability to kind of take people off of the dribble and attack the basket is really impressive from what I've seen. Kind of some shades, I think of, of Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. And I, I'm kind of cheating here a little bit, going back to a, you know, a WCC player who uh, was maybe a little bit, uh, underrated and under discussed coming into the draft process who had a great year. Um, but yeah, Pepperdine, I, I think, I think Lewis is a, is a really quality player who can you know, kind of play inside and out as a combo forward can defend multiple positions. Um, probably going to be a second round pick would be my guess. But if, if we look up in a few years and he's like the 26th most productive player in the class, like wouldn't totally shock me. Mm. Um, someone who I think is maybe a little bit, overvalued so i'm gonna go here with someone who i think has a very high floor and and this is not a knock on him i love his game i think he can be a really quality nba player but just in general this probably speaks more to my draft philosophy of like do i want to take a swing on like high upside or take like a safe bet Mm. Uh, jordan hawkins from from uconn i already gave Andre Jackson Jr., a ton of love here. So I'm trying to split kind of the fence here on on UConn love. I love Andre Jackson Jr. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that Jordan Hawkins is like someone who will, in in a few years from now, um, will look back and be like, oh, I can see like, I can see why maybe he went like number 16 in this draft or whatever. Um, I think he's going to be a really good player in the NBA. But talking to some people at the combine, I think there's some concerns about like, how high his ceiling is exactly like he's a great spot up shooter if you watch him he like runs around like crazy on offense like he's his own like self shot creation machine in that he can you can just run him off screens um he he gets open like he runs a ton of action but he's not someone I, who i think is going to win as a shooter like creating his own shot off the bounce i don't think he's someone who's going to create his own shot just like dribble jumpers and so I think there's some limitations to his game about what he can be. Um, he's only six foot four. If you're projecting like shooting guard, small forward onto him, like I think size wise, there could be some limitations about what, what positions he'll be able to defend and, and at what level he'll be able to do that. So I, I really like his game. I think he's gonna be a great shooter in the NBA, but could end up being like someone who, if he's drafted, you know, in, in the mid to late teens or something, He'll be a good player, but I don't think he'll be like, there'll be better players, I think, that get drafted after him um, who develop in time into more productive players. Um, high high floor for sure, but like the ceiling is, I think, somewhat capped with, with what he's going to be in the NBA. 
Finally, Kyle, I have to ask you about the very top of this draft, Victor Winbanyama. And specifically, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on the San Antonio Spurs landing him with their their yeah. draft history of, of really successful big men uh, and really successful number one overall picks. Like what, when you saw them win the draft lottery, win the Victor Winbanyama sweepstakes, essentially, like what, what did you think about Winbanyama's future in San Antonio? Because he sure looked happy about it. He did look happy about it, and he specifically looked very happy that it wasn't in Houston, which right. <laughs> fantastic. Love the video. Known Houston hater. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I, I thought it was good. Um, I think it's going to be a great fit. I think it'll be a good situation for him. The Spurs, I think, are you know a, a proven or, organization that have yeah you know, has consistently been um, one of the best developmental spots for for young players. That that roster, I think, is is in a spot where it's not going to be a contender right away, but there's some really interesting pieces. I think that they can put around him. I think they'll probably have a, a good system in place where they will want to develop him, bring him along at a slow pace. Remember he's just a teenager. He's like seven foot five has roughly a 14 foot wingspan. Like there's, I think you want to be as safe with him as possible, bringing him along. There's no reason to rush and make him play 82 games as a rookie. And I think the Spurs fully know that know that you know we're going to put a place in it's not a plan for for one year it's not a plan for uh, 2025 let's plan for three four years down the road let's bring this thing along and it's really build something so yeah it was it was exciting to be in the room watching the spurs win win the lottery i think victor women is going to be really happy about that um women is uh like someone who i think goes into like meticulous planning about like his game his development his preparation like this is a guy who does like barefoot bare finger like bear crawls in pregame workouts which is just hilarious like he does like big toe workouts and so uh, the attention to detail like some stuff i think that uh has come out i think is really fascinating uh from you know kind of a player franchise alignment standpoint i mean it's like it's uh maybe i should have seen this coming it's i think it's gonna be a great fit i think it's gonna be really good for the nba that the spurs are going to have one of the most exciting players in the NBA next season. Well, Kyle, you work so hard year round, not just during draft time, but of course things really pick up around this time of the year. So to get you this close to the draft is a real treat. Hopefully you're getting some rest and getting some sleep before draft night itself, but you almost made it. Thank you so much for your perspective for joining locked on Kings, my friend looking forward to doing it next year. Although hopefully the Kings are really at the end of the, uh, the, the draft next year. actually, they might not have a pick if their pick conveys and goes to Atlanta, they might not have a first round pick. So I'll have you on just to talk about everybody else's problems while the Kings are sitting Absolutely. there. Just, just relaxing, but I appreciate you, Kyle, so much. Thanks for doing this. Of course. Anytime. Thanks, Matt. Big thank you to Kyle for joining me here on the Locked on Kings podcast today. It really is a treat. It's a pleasure to talk to him. If he mentioned any names that maybe you're uh, you're interested in, you like a lot, you like the idea of those prospects, uh, if you want to uh, uh, share your input on who the Sacramento Kings should be looking at, share those with us at Matt George Sack on Twitter. You can email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com or leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. The draft is going to be here before we know it, people, so we got to really start gearing up. Uh, for that, of course, keep it right here on Locked on Kings in the buildup and on draft day itself for all of the coverage of the Sacramento Kings uh, NBA draft. Of course, if you could uh, do us a favor, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit subscribe and uh, turn on that notification bell. Also share this podcast with your friends. If you're an audio listener, my OG audio listeners, head over to uh, the uh, the Locked on Kings page on um Apple Podcasts or on iTunes. If you could leave a review there, hit five stars, and you could even leave a little custom blurb about what you like about the podcast, why you'd encourage others to listen to the podcast. It's also a great place for constructive criticism if you have it. Uh, you can put that there. Uh, and then my Spotify listeners, I haven't forgot about you. You, of course, uh, can leave a, a review out of five stars. No custom reviews or anything like that, but if you could hit five stars on Spotify, that would help us out a ton too. Thank you so much for your support. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.